So today I'm starting the first of two recap sessions uh, looking at the, the big story. Now these sessions are meant to cover First and Second Chronicles, which are in and of themselves just recap books, as it were, recovering sort of all of the story. Okay, so they recover they cover sort of a lot of you know the David stuff and, and you know it just goes back all the way through the kings and the history of Judah and Israel. And so in the same way, we're just going to recap the big story, starting at the very beginning, before time, as it were, and then just working our way through over these next two sessions, just to, to remind ourselves of the things that we've been learning. And these two are going to be my favourite of the all of the sessions, I think, in a way, because they give us the overall story, the big story, all in one go. And I just love that. I just love to see it all sort of work its way out. So... Um, I've mentioned many times that there's these two major themes in Scripture, exile and exodus, travelling away from God and then travelling back to God. And it's the story of our souls. It's the story of your soul and my soul, um, our own exile, our own exodus, out of bondage, back towards God. In Romans chapter 11, verse 36, Paul writes, For from him, through him, and to him, are all things to him be glory forever amen and that's the grand sweep of history that it's from him through him and ultimately back to him it's these themes of exile and exodus and we cannot know the past perfectly none of us do we've all got our own views of what's happened our own interpretations etc none of us have the whole of the past and we cannot certainly understand the present with all of its complexities, all of the change, all of the confusion, but we do know the end. Okay, so Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 28 puts it this way, and when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected everything to him, so that God may be all in all. So the end goal of history, the currents are all flowing downhill towards God becoming all in all. It, is God in all of you today? I, I don't think so. He's not all in me. Um, but one day he will be friends. One day he's going to be all in all. That's the end to which all of history is rushing. In the words of Philippians chapter 2 verses 10 and 11, so at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. And that's the end of history, folks. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. And that Christ must reign until all offer him their allegiance. So that every knee will bow and God will become all in all. Um, A.W. Tozer once said, no adequate view of human nature is possible until we believe that we came from God and that we should go back to God again. And this is our own exodus, thanks to Jesus, the Messiah, and is the means of our return back to the Father. So Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 writes, he is the one who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not based on our works, but on his own purpose and grace granted to us in Christ Jesus before time began. I love these sort of passages that it's Christ who saved us, not by our works, but by the grace of God. And his purpose was for us in Christ before time began. Now think about that. Before time began, God knew you. He had a plan for your life. Scientists, I've said this before, estimate the universe to be 13.8 billion Earth years old. You know, we measure time based on how many times the Earth goes around the sun, don't we? So, um, but if that's true, then, you know, 13.8 billion rotations of the Earth around the sun, um, that's long before you, long before I had any thought of existence you know any sort of human existence but yet god knew you he'd written your name in his book you existed in god's thoughts he had plans for you in jesus to bring you to glory that's wonderful isn't it and there's no before or after in god he's not limited by time 
you know, he knows the end from the beginning. It's all one in that sense. So Paul writes in Ephesians 1 verse 4 and 5, he chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He did this by predestining us to adoption as his legal heirs through Jesus Christ, according to the pleasure of his will. It's amazing, isn't it? It's beautiful. The God's plan and purpose for you, perhaps 13.8 billion rotations of the earth around the sun, before the foundations of the world, that you would be holy, blameless before him in love. For Christians then, creation doesn't start at Adam, but with Christ. Because all of God's plans are from Christ. He's going to create people. He's got plans and purposes for people in Christ. Christ is the start. He's the Achi. He's the beginning in that sense. He's the first. He's of first importance. Okay, so all things are going to come through him. Okay, so he's the first in that sense. So for Christians, creation starts with Christ. Paul writes in Romans 5.14, Now Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ, who was yet to come. Okay, so Adam was a copy of Christ, who was yet to come. Christ is the first. So Adam, who came in time before Christ, was a copy of the one who was to come. That's what Paul says in Romans 5.14. So in this passage, is we... We read that God is thinking about you. He's got plans and purposes for you in Jesus Christ, even before creation. Even before creation. He, he made us a dust of the earth, you know, a substance that fades, that, that fades away as copies of the Messiah. Uh, Paul calls Christ the heavenly man. Okay. And... Adam and Eve, their names mean human and life. They listen to the voice of the serpent. And instead of drawing their life from God, they choose that they want to become their own masters. And all of us follow in their shoes. It's a story of human life, as their name suggests. Every single one of us come into this world and we follow our own desires, our own way of being. We are all, in that sense, Adam and Eve. We're all human life separated from the life of God. We begin to die, to fade. We are dust after all. And each of us comes into existence separated from the life of God, destined to die. And that's not a surprise for God. It's always plan A. You know, Jesus Christ is plan A. Okay. And that means that his death on the cross was plan A. Okay. So Adam's exile from Eden then must be seen as part of plan A. Okay. That all of us are born into this world. There's something redemptive about it. Okay. History has always been rushing towards a risen, crucified one. Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is the very centre of history. It's what it's all about. So God's purpose in this is that we might realise our utter dependence upon him. We come to realise that we don't create ourselves. That we're created by him. That we are only dust and to dust we will return. And for early Christians like Irenaeus, when God says, let us make humankind in our image after our likeness, he then makes humanity in his image, but we're not yet in his likeness, okay? Because that comes through Jesus Christ. So without Jesus having come into the world, we even forgot what it was to image God, to represent him in the world. However, Jesus as the image, the likeness of God, reveals what we are to become. And one day we will be like him. Okay. So Paul writes in Romans 8 verse 29. Because those whom he foreknew, because of those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the son, that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Okay. First Corinthians 15, 49. And just as we've borne the image of the man of dust, let us also bear the image of the man of heaven. Okay. So God's plan and purpose for you, even perhaps 13.8 billion years ago, before the very foundations of the earth, was that you, having been born 
of flesh, of dust, made in the image of God, would take on the likeness of God, being fashioned after the man of heaven, the man who is glorified in heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that process happens through death. The death has been transformed and reversed so that it, the tomb is now the womb to new life. Okay, So we would become like the risen, crucified one, like Jesus Christ, the only true human in that sense. But you existed in his thoughts and plans even before the stars, the earth had ever been formed. And now we think about Satan. If he wanted to rebel against God, to get a, a group of fallen angels together and form an army, if God is everywhere, where would he go to attack? How do you attack a being who is everywhere present, in whom we live and breathe and have our being? How do you dethrone a being who is everywhere present, who's causing everything to exist moment by moment? Gregory the Great argued that God is enthroned in our hearts of his creatures. So to dethrone God, Satan needed to turn hearts away from God to other things. And the fixing of this world, therefore, is found in the enthronement of God in the creature's hearts once more. It's about our allegiance, making God the very centre of all that we are, so that we reflect his life and light into the world. If you're not reflecting his light, then you have only darkness. So we're born into this created world and it fills our minds. As Paul says in Romans 1 verse 25, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. They worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is praised forever. Amen. And this is our dilemma. We forgot what God was like and we turned to worshipping created things things, whether spirits, angels, men, animals, rather than the uncreated creator. The serpent's lie was that Adam could have the likeness of God by independence from God. The gospel tells us that we will be like God, however, through Jesus of Nazareth, by giving up our independence, choosing to become like clay in the potter's hands, to allow him to shape and to mould us according to his purpose. It's not by independence but rather by total dependence and Paul in Colossians chapter 3 verse 10 says that we've been clothed with a new man and we're being renewed in the knowledge according to the image of the one who created it John puts it this way first John chapter 3 verse 2 dear friends we're God's children now that we have but what we will be has not yet been revealed we know that whatever is revealed, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. So although John says, you know, we don't fully know what we will be like, we do know that we will be like him, like the Son of God, like the Messiah. Okay, Because he has revealed to us what God is like and therefore what humanity is like. Okay, So he's revealed himself as the one upon the cross, the risen, crucified one the one who lays down his life for the other, who comes not to be served, but to serve. And friends, read the Gospels, familiarise yourself with the Gospels, come to know Jesus Christ as he has been revealed there. If we are to be like him, we must first know what he is like. In my Genesis sermon, I mentioned God's plan and purpose in choosing Abraham so that all of the nations would be blessed through him. And the purpose of Israel's election was that all of the nations would find their way back to God. One thing to remember then in reading the Exodus story is that all of us are in exile. Adam and Eve, their names meaning human and life, are exiles from Eden. Cain and his family from the land of wandering. All of humanity from the Tower of Babel. The nation of Israel is in exile from the land of promise to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. Not only are they exiled, but they're enslaved. And this is our story as well. We're enslaved to sin, to death, and to the unseen spiritual powers. We need our own exodus. We need a way out from bondage. And the purpose of God's blessing upon Abraham was that through him, all of his descendants, um, all of the nations of the earth would one day return to the one true God, um, through Abraham's descendant, the Messiah. 
Part of the problem, however, is our separation from God, our loss of knowledge about what God was like, our enslavement to the false gods who ruled over the nations. And these are the things that Jesus came to deal with. He removes our sin. He shows us what God is like. He disarms those false gods who rule in the heavenly realms. He revokes their authority. And all of these questions are answered. We are here to represent God in the world, to shine the light of God's consciousness, as it were, into the material world. And our purpose is to represent God in creation, to be his hands and his feet, to act as he was acting in the world. But what went wrong? God was dethroned from our hearts, from our minds, and we turned to other things. As Paul said, our minds were darkened and we worshipped created things. The world turned to darkness. We forgot what God was like, which means we forgot what it was meant to be human, who are the image of God. So God divides up humanity. He chose Israel as his own purpose so that through them, all of the nations of the earth would come back to him. And there are also questions that Jesus comes to answer. These are the way it's revealed. He restores the image of God to humanity so that we now know exactly what God is like, because Jesus has perfectly revealed him. He shows us what God is like by the way he dies as a man in self-sacrificial love for the other. And therefore he shows us how to be human again. He destroyed the enemy's greatest weapon, death, that he had used to enslave us to the love of created things. He destroyed death by death and changed its use. And by disarming those powers and authorities, he overcame them by the cross. And by rising again, he's now drawing all of the nations to himself. He's the offspring of Abraham, through whom all the nations are blessed. And I've mentioned previously about Deuteronomy 32, how God divided up the nations among his heavenly court, how he chose Israel for himself. Israel is his slice of the pizza, as it were. And the language of this passage links back to the idea of Israel as a special possession out of all of the nations. They're chosen, however, in order that they might be a kingdom of priests to reach all of the nations. And every Israelite was called to be a priest, a mediator between the one true God and the nations of the earth. And the tribe of Levi um, hadn't originally been set apart in that way, but they would later be. But every Israelite was originally called to be a priest to the nations. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter writes this to those in the Messiah. For you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Friends, that is your role now in the world, to be his kingdom of priests, to call everyone you meet out of darkness into the light of Christ. You are God's special possession in his Messiah. So in conclusion, you've been created to become like Jesus of Nazareth, the true human, who's the perfect image and likeness of God. And this begins by giving allegiance to God, by enthroning him once again in our hearts, and by seeking to do his will in the world. We're his kingdom of priests, to call everyone we meet out of darkness into the light of Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just... Um, just glorify you for this story, Lord, this overall narrative, Lord, this big story, Lord, that we're learning about, Lord, how you, even before the foundations of the earth, called us in the Messiah, that you had plans in Christ Jesus for every single one of us. And we just thank you that through your son, you have brought all things to be for their very purposes. And you bring us in times and in season into existence in order that we might be conformed and changed into the image of Christ, that we might be like him, so that when he returns, we will see him as he is and we will be like him. We thank you for that, Lord. Help us to shine your light into the world and to re reflect that light of Christ wherever we go. In the name of your Son, our Lord.